Thank you everyone for taking the time today to join us as we will be discussing laser scanning and modeling cultural heritage sites using cloud-enabled workflows. A couple of housekeeping notes. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel for future viewing and review. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A panel and we will answer them during the presentation or at the end of the, as time permits. We would also like to thank our partner and co-sponsor, Case Technologies, for their active participation in this webinar. Case Technologies provides technical solutions to meet customers' needs in the AEC industry to help them achieve their strategic goals. Case Technologies provides services such as consulting, hardware, and software sales and implementation training. Please visit them at their website, www.casetech.com, for more information. Now let's discuss the topics we'll, we will be covering in today's presentation. We will be discussing the importance of scanning heritage sites for preservation, documentation, and research. Next, we will talk about scanning sites multiple times to detect changes and evolutions over time. Then we will discuss public outreach and engagement via cloud technologies, then moving to creating deliverables for various use cases. After that, we will have some closing comments and finally a brief Q&A session. So now I am proud to introduce our panel of guest speakers. First, we will have Douglas Pritchard, who is a lecturer and a member of the Advanced Academic Program at John Hopkins University. We also have Paul Aubin, who is an author and member of the board uh, for the Volterra Detroit Foundation. Next, we have Mark Dietrich, who is the Director of Services at Case Technologies and also a member of the board of the Volterra Detroit Foundation. Next, we have Sylvie Stoyan, who is the Director of RC Monkeys. And lastly, we have Dominique Pulokin, who is the CEO of Sintu US. So now I'd like to turn it over to Douglas Pritchard, and he will discuss the importance of scanning heritage sites for preservation, documentation, and research. Take it away, Doug. Uh, thank you, Rob. Okay. So uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Douglas Pritchard. I'm a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University and a senior research fellow at the Cyprus University of Technology. And today I'm gonna speak to you about the current challenges facing cultural heritage sites and structures and how new management systems can assist in the digital preservation effort. Here you can see a list of challenges that international sites uh, are currently facing. Everything from maintenance to arson, fire, sea level rise, global warming, and of course, the more subtle uh, issue of weather and time. And I think it stopped. Could you, Rob, could you, yeah, there we go. Okay, um, so heritage sites around the world, uh, as you're all likely aware, are facing a variety of risks and challenges including acid rain, uh, air pollution, urban encroachment, excessive tourism. Uh, this is a, an incredible site that's 5,000 years old. This is uh, Scarabray up in Neolithic Orkney, um, and that is struggling currently with uh, sea level rise. This is more of a pragmatic challenge. This is a project that we did at the Large Hadron Collider uh, at CERN in Geneva. And the purpose here was the, the issues of pragmatic change. So at CERN, the, um, uh, they were involved, or they're currently involved in a substantial uh, retrofit of this cavern, uh, which is 100 meters below ground. And what we wanted to do was go in and capture this space as, because it is one of the most significant spaces for scientific research in the world um, to show what it currently exists and what it will look like. Um, this is another project. Uh, this is Cardross Seminary, uh, just north of Glasgow in Scotland, which was an amazing uh, building designed in 1961 and essentially left to ruin. Uh, the result is uh, we went there with a whole series of uh, uh, scanners to scan the site very quickly. And actually, Rob, if you could just pause here for one second. Um, the important aspect of that project was that it was uh, the capabilities that you now have with technologies is really quite remarkable. The amount of data that you generate in a very short period of time 
is significantly uh, better uh, than it was, say, 10 years ago. And it, clearly, that will increase. But the amount of data is a challenge, and the management of that data is obviously a challenge when it comes to cultural heritage. Um, if we could just, if, Rob, if you could hit play again. Uh, this is uh, the institution that I used to work at years ago. This is the famous Glasgow School of Art that was designed by the architect Charles Rennie McIntosh. And unfortunately, in 2014 and 2018, the building caught on fire. Um, th this this uh, building and like Notre Dame Cathedral, demonstrates the importance of proper documentation uh, on, a, on a regular basis, both the interior and exterior. Um, the next project that we have here, this is the Cologne Cathedral project that I was involved with years ago. Um, and this is an interesting project in, the, in that uh, the building, the Cologne Cathedral has a number of challenges, both in terms of the environmental degradation and the excessive tourism, seismic issues. Um, but the challenge for us when doing this project, um, and this is, that was uh, the guys from Zola and Froelich, uh, was the size and scale of the building. So as uh, trying to document the building as best as possible, these are all the scan locations that we went to, um, scanning from the ground level all the way up onto the towers and uh, approximately 650 scans, high resolution scans in combination with 360 degree HDR imagery. Um, so the point of this project uh, is the, the data generation is extreme. And here you have an image, uh, a plan view of the building of just the scan data, and that's the combined interior and exterior scan data. Um, the biggest project, uh, problem after the scanning, the physical nature of just all that scanning, is the data management. Um, how to uh, put it together properly, but then circulate it among the people that are interested in the project. Um, always a big problem. And the variety of people that are interested in the data could be anything from the scan team, the IT person, uh, but the conservation team, um, and some of them have, uh, don't have the skills to, to manipulate a point cloud. Um, so the advantage of uh, an online system that is very clear and explicit is that you could um, present that data to a variety of different people in a very quick way. Um, just showing off more of the, this is the high res data of the cathedral at grade, and now this has been meshed. Um, and this is what I think is quite exciting, exciting to me as a researcher, how you're really be, being able to push the data into some significant realms. These next two projects I'm just going to speak over uh, in, in general. Um, I should point out that they were initiated uh, by the University of Rome at Sapienza, and I was fortunate to be part of it. Um, it was initiated by Carlo Bianchini um, at the University of Rome Sapienza. And this is where we're beginning to use the SIN2 software, which has really turned out to be a fantastic tool. We're able to do a whole series of scans and put it into this system. And it isn't just visualizing the scan data. Um, it's also, to me as a researcher, the ability to interrogate all the metadata and have a real clear understanding of what has been accomplished um, and, and potentially what needs to be accomplished. And using this as a water level, to move forward in, in further work. The other aspect is that if you are capable of using Google Earth, uh, you're able to utilize this software. And that's fantastic when communicating to a large team. Some who may not be technical, some may be uh, the architects, the conservators, but people involved in the overall project management or um, even on the finance side in terms of the budgets of con the conservation project. So a very easy tool, tool to use, but a very effective communication tool. Um, this is really cool. This is uh, uh, Michelangelo's sketches um, down in the crypt of the chapel. And uh, that's, that's it for me. All right, thanks, Doug. This is uh, Mark Dietrich, again, Director of Services with Case Technologies, as Rob uh, introduced. And Paul and I will be speaking here a little bit about uh, our project that we've been heading uh, in Volterra, Italy. 
and the use of Sintu software on that project. Uh, as mentioned, we are both members of the board of directors for the Volterra Detroit Foundation. And that foundation is a nonprofit organization that we formed uh, 10 years ago. It was formed by the alumni and faculty of the University of Detroit Mercy School of Architecture to establish and operate a residential college in Volterra, Italy. And Volterra is an ancient Tuscan hilltop town. It's been continually continually inhabited for over 3,000 years. Uh, it has some of the most historically significant uh, sites and artifacts in all of Italy, uh, spanning through all of these eras, which makes it very unique. In 2016, the foundation, along with my company, Case Technologies, and Autodesk and other sponsors, started a yearly reality capture workshop in which participants digitally can reconstruct and preserve many of the historically significant uh, architectural, archeological, and artistic treasures of the ancient city. And Sintu Cloud has been a key component of this project as we will discuss. So, Paul? Thanks, Mark. Um, so, uh, we're here in Sintu Cloud with our uh, data from Volterra. We're specifically looking at the Porta Arco, which is the Etruscan arch. It's one of only two uh, surviving um, arches from Etruscan times in Italy. And um, uh, we're here looking at works, uh, work zones, which um, you can see that we've scanned this site actually each year, each workshop. And our, our aim is to, uh, to look for any, you know, small changes over time that might occur uh, in the site. And one of the impetuses for this was a, a few years before we started the workshop, part of the medieval wall that you can see kind of uh, on either side of the arch here, um, collapsed uh, and they didn't really have any adequate documentation of uh, the wall before the collapse so they had to kind of uh, you know wing it if you will in the restoration so our hope is that among other things the scan data can provide um, a better source of what was there uh, should a catastrophe occur and that you want to um, try and restore so here uh, we've got the work zone panel open in Sintu Cloud and you can see that you can hide and show uh, various work zones and we've just organized them by year in this case, but you can set them up any way you like. And then you can jump into any scan position as we're doing now and kind of look around in a variety of visualization styles. So uh, we're going between uh, RGB mode here and uh, mesh mode. Now this is one of our favorite modes right here where you can actually see that Sintu Cloud is meshing the model in a very high level of detail. And we can kind of move around in that model and uh, and look at the details in a way that's um, sometimes a little more difficult when you're looking right at the native point cloud. Um, in particular, you don't see through everything like you would with a point cloud. So it's got that surface there and you can see that the resolution of that surface is quite nice. Um, we're uh, at a different vantage point here, kind of looking down in the arch. Um, and then you can still see the little bubbles there so we can jump to any scan position uh, just like we, uh, we could in other software. So it, it makes it very easy to navigate around um, directly in uh, Sintu Cloud here. And then once again, switch visualization modes if you like. Now we're not showing it here, but there's also an X-ray mode and an intensity mode. So there's a few other modes that you can use to interrogate your, um, your scan data if you like. So uh, uh, I think I got ahead of my uh, video here. So we'll show a few more surfaces there. Um, but what we're about to do is move into a different spot here where we're going to start talking about comparison. So uh, once again, we're using the work zones for the comparison. So you can compare two work zones to one another. And that's uh, one of the reasons why setting up work zones are important. And in this case, because we had scan data from different points in time, you know, we're looking for any uh, shifts or changes. Now, some of the changes you might see might just be a difference in scan equipment that we use. We didn't use the same equipment year over year. So that's um, uh, interesting in itself. And then a nearby building was under renovation. So you can clearly see the scaffolding in this uh, image here uh, was different. Uh, not to mention, you know, people and other things that show up in the scan. So that helps you identify things that might need to be cleaned up. But there's both a visual difference tool and a uh, visual check tool. So this is the visual check right now, and you can see that you can slide between the two. So you kind of have uh, go from one 
uh, data set to another by just sort of sliding between them. And that's, uh, that can be a really nice way to interrogate uh, what's changed and what's different uh, versus the visual difference tool where it just sort of puts them superimposed and, and uses the colors, the different colors, the green and red in this case, uh, to distinguish uh, the differences. So both are valuable and um, you can easily jump between the two to uh, identify spots that have changed or that, uh, that you know, maybe aren't lined up properly or that uh, have uh, undergone damage, erosion, change, any of the things that Douglas talked about. So uh, it's a wonderful tool. And as you can see, pretty, pretty user-friendly. I mean, it all relies on just setting up those work zones. And once you have those uh, configured, um, then it's very easy to use these tools to, uh, to do this kind of analysis. And I think we're just about at the end there. You could see a little bit of the, um, the walls on either side of the arch. I love the way this arch is, you know, they just sort of incorporated it right in the medieval wall. That's one of our favorite parts of this uh, uh, Etruscan arch is that it's just sort of been become part of the fabric of the city like so many other things in Volterra. Okay, I turn it back to Mark. Great, thanks Paul. And uh, I'm gonna ask for control here from Rob in just a sec. Okay. There we go. So next topic we're going to talk about here is public outreach and the use of this technology to really help extend our data. We like to talk about it as democratizing the data, uh, taking all this massive amount of data that Doug, Doug talked about having this problem, 650 scans. Well, how do we get that into people's hands so that they can value, they can, they can gain the value of, of the work that we're doing? We have this, the same problem uh, with the work we're doing here in Volterra. So we have established a website, and you can see the URL right here. I'd encourage you all to visit it uh, if you'd like, uh, where we're trying to use this website to explain everything we're doing in Volterra the research that's happening around the workshops that we're doing, the reality capture workshops that we're doing. So we're documenting the sites that we've already scanned, uh, the technologies that we're using, the team uh, that's involved, all of our partners. So pretty much all the information about our workshop uh, you can find here. So I encourage you uh, to visit our site if you would. And you can also learn about future workshops, which you're all uh, very much uh, happy to sign up for. We, we, it's an open invitation to sign up for our workshops. Obviously, we had to cancel it this year because of what's going on uh, with the, the COVID, but uh, we'll be definitely restructuring our workshops here moving forward. Uh, so let's go ahead into our models tab right here. So this is what we really like about Sintu is the ability to take the, this massive amount of scan data that we have and make it available to anyone publicly just by simply coming here and clicking on a link. Um, this is a pub, all publicly available. You can all go and do this on your own uh, and just view these sites, any of these sites that we've scanned. Uh, and I think it's already been mentioned that it's super easy to use. Pretty much anybody who's uh, used the Google Maps platform uh, would understand how to follow these scan locations uh, and navigate throughout to see these sites. Okay, and the all of the display modes that Paul talked about are available here as well. So you can see we can switch to the surface mode that Paul described and continue to navigate and explore these sites. So. All that's needed is internet connection and a browser and a special software. So this really gives us that ability to extend this data to anybody in the, in the world, uh, not worrying about how we're gonna get this massive amount of data into their hands, what software they have or don't have, what their expertise level is, et cetera. Uh, so it solves a pretty significant problem for us. We've been really happy uh, to use this technology in this way. So that gives you a little bit of sense uh, for that. And then this particular project that I pulled up here, which is the San Felice Gate and Springs, it's one of uh, the other gates into the city. 
there's actually a research project going on here right now being uh, done out of the University of Pisa. So we were able to extend this data to them very easily. And we were able to invite certain researchers in and give them elevated privileges so they can actually download the data and start to work with it. So again, that, this is what really gives us that ability to outreach to the public and not really worry about what they have on their end to be able to consume and visualize this data. So I think it goes over to Dominic next. Hi. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, uh, no, please go back. Okay, anyway, fine. Uh, yeah, I'm Dominic uh, Pudiquin, co-founder of Sin2. I'm uh, in charge of business development and product management. Uh, so uh, another way to engage with stakeholders, uh, say non-experts, or, or the public is after you have invested uh, in laser scanning and eventually in modeling the, the site, is uh, to display the content in an immersive way using uh, virtual reality devices. Uh, so most companies will create such immersive experiences by creating a single mesh from the laser base on cloud uh, and then use uh, this 3D content in such platforms as uh, Unity or Unreal. Um, this is definitely a great workflow but you need a lot of time to optimize this unique 3D mesh with regard to uh, polygon count or texture map sizes. So what we propose is an alternative to this workflow uh, by leveraging the high resolution mesh streaming capability of Sintu Cloud in a web browser and the embedded web VR features of Mozilla Firefox mostly. It also works with Google Chrome, but we found some issues with their uh, latest uh, support of web VR. So you'd rather use Mozilla Firefox to benefit from that. Uh, so next slide, please. So the result of this uh, VR uh, streaming experience is really amazing to my opinion. Uh, and again, it comes with no extra preparation and at no extra cost. There is no need to spend days optimizing your content since the mesh streaming will always deliver the highest possible resolution for each one of your scans in your stereoscopic vision. So you can then move from scan to scan and be immersed in each scan position. On uh, moving from scan to scan may be seen as a limitation, but uh, from our experience, uh, many people prefer to use this Google uh, Street View type of immersive experience rather than a full 3D navigation. Because in this full 3D navigation, people get lost. You may be, get lost by going through the walls or through the floors. Uh, you can change the display settings from RGB to the surface or even X-ray. Uh, you can make uh, measurements. Uh, the surface mode will certainly give you access to the very fine details captured by the laser beam. Uh, and you can also uh, make point-to-point -point measurements uh, to get accurate distances. So soon you will be able uh, to add notes and comments as well. And, uh, we tend to, uh, and those notes and comments will enrich the project metadata that is stored in the cloud. So this uh, Sinto Cloud VR streaming feature is compatible with the Oculus Rift, Rift S, and the HTC Vive Pro. Uh, and, uh, this is another example. This is a Volterra baptistery, uh, which has been scanned with a, a Leica RTC360. Uh, this is an interesting example, not only because it's a wonderful piece of architecture uh, from the 13th century, uh, standing just in front of the Duomo of Volterra in the center of the city, but in this case, where the scans also have been used to create a BIM model, a process known as scan to BIM. So using your VR headset, you can enjoy the beautiful architecture, as you can see here in very, very fun details, make all the measurements you want, but also you can switch between uh, the scan data and the BIM model, as you will see now. Okay, so this is a BIM model that has been scanned, that has been modeled from the scans. On the VR streaming application will allow you to experience either the existing conditions and the BIM model or the two uh, separately. Okay, so we plan to enhance this, to enhance this feature later with some uh, QA uh, to, to allow for QA QC process, so detecting issues. Uh, between the as built conditions on the BIM model. Next slide, please.
So the advantage of uh, your streaming application from Cinto Cloud is that you can have an unlimited number of users being immersed individually at the same time in the same 3D space from anywhere. Uh, we also plan to enhance the application and add more immersive collaborative features, such as viewing other participants with their avatars. So give it a try. Uh, it's re really an interesting feature. We can move to the next uh, topic of the agenda. So uh, still Dominic speaking, I will act as a moderator here. In this next session, uh, we will discuss the most demanded deliverables for the cultural heritage sites that have been scanned. Uh, as we all know, scanning a site is, uh, is an investment. So you'd rather find all the possible ways to justify this, this investment by providing the right data for, to the right people. Uh, so my first question will be for you, Doug. Uh, what do experts like yourself expect as deliverables from scanning on heritage site? Um, what we would expect as deliverables is uh, it, it depends on the project, but typically it would be uh, as research, we give the IP over to the site. So you'd be delivering a hard drive full of um, scans and the imagery. And then if there's a UAV involved, you have a, uh, a whole listing of uh, photographs. Uh, and then the output could be anything from BIM, CAD to 3D models or 3D animations. So it's a, it's a real range, but the delivery is, um, I, I would say, uh, slightly um, clunky in that you're, you're presenting a, a drive, typically. Um, you certainly couldn't email 650 scans. Excellent. Uh, so uh, building documentation on making uh, the data available in the cloud, uh, all this data, you will participate uh, to this uh, democratization, I would say, of uh, using laser scanning for uh, cultural heritage, right? Yes, I think the important thing is that, you know, when you hand over, or in the past, handing over a hard drive, uh, you know, it give, it's given over to the IT guy or the person in charge of survey at the site. And the advantage of putting on the cloud is fantastic because then you're getting it off a dangerous hard drive and you're, you're you know, you're virtually protecting it. Um, but putting on the cloud is one thing. It's the navigation through the data that I think is very important and what makes your software very unique. Um, understanding exactly what you have as opposed to seeing just a whole series of, of icons. And as mentioned, you know, the, the presentation of that data in Sintu is easily understood by people that have very limited um, technical knowledge, but you know, they could be the, the people that are in charge of the site and in charge of the budgets for the site. So it's really important. Excellent question for you, Mark. Uh, it seems that uh, asset management or facility management uh, is, is another use case for laser scanning a site, like uh, a cultural heritage site, right? What, what are the expectations of the owners or stakeholders uh, in this field? Yeah, uh, good question. So typically when we think about using technology for facilities management, asset management, we're focused on better maintaining mechanical, electrical systems, plumbing systems, those sorts of things. And th those are really important uh, and there's an incredible value there. But when we're capturing historical structures, it allows us to document many of the other important historically significant elements within these structures. Uh, so what we've seen things very important, historically significant doors, windows, ornamentations, light fixtures, you know, chandeliers, it just goes on and on, F furnishings, artwork, sculptures that are within these facilities, all historically significant. So each of these assets has their own story. Uh, their own historical significance. So being able to capture those and be able to, through the capture, be able to assess their state um, is important to a, f a facility owner and operator uh, and better maintain those assets, but then also be able to connect information to them, that historical information documentation about all those individual assets within the building. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's what makes this really unique from a heritage perspective. 
would that would you say uh, uh doug that this asset management and conservation management will, would have the same objectives or is it a different uh, topic certainly there's an overlap I, I would say that the um with regards to conservation management um this has been touched upon but i think the 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 method uh, or the approach to reduce complexity is very important. Um, scan data is is can be very heavy and awkward, but putting it on a cloud and being able to navigate freely is uh, is a fantastic thing. So that adds a lot of clar clarity to a project. Um, one thing with specific to conservation management that that I think is very important is the communication of the data to a wider team. And a lot of times, or a lot of the sites that I've been involved with, some on islands or some up in northern Scotland, uh, you know, they're remote sites. And the real conservation team, the, say the contractors or the, the people responsible for the conservation budgets, are in a city like Edinburgh or Glasgow or in London, and they're the decision makers. So, you know, you know they can't fly up to these sites. Uh, to say that, yes, okay, this, that needs to be replaced and this is how much money it's going to cost and we're going to sign off on that. But taking it to them virtually beyond just photographs uh, is, uh, is a fantastic method. And then also the whole issue of monitoring change. So if you identify a, uh, an issue that's problematic at a site, um, having it documented once and then say six months later, once that stone has been repaired or, or the lintel has been changed, scan it and then send that back and and you know so that you can clearly understand that the work has been done properly dominic one other uh, really interesting thing from an asset management perspective that we've uh, discovered in Volterra is that oftentimes there are parts and pieces of structures that are repurposed uh, elsewhere throughout the city uh, on, on new building projects and uh, we've been able to actually scan these uh these fragments if you will and then digitally reconstruct the the original structure right kind of put them back in place uh, also uh, we've been able to, to scan assets that reside in museums but were originally in let's say an etruscan tomb uh, and so it's possible for us now to to reconstruct that etruscan tomb with all of the assets that were inside of it so i think that's a really Another very uh, unique aspect of the asset management use case. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, uh, one of the deliverables that uh, we have been talking a lot about is is getting a BIM model, an accurate BIM model from the scans. And uh, uh, Silvio, I know that you will be uh, providing a great example of this scan to be process in the next session, but. Before that, can you speak about your challenges for uh, getting to this uh, BIM model and eventually outsourcing this, uh, or organizing the work? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Dominic. So um, the last three months uh, with this whole COVID situation taught us a very good lesson about developing digital products. And that is that's critical for the survival of the business to set systems that will allow the production team to work remotely. The biggest challenge working with laser scan data is storage management and data distribution. And uh, if the entire production team is located in the same physical space, then the solution is pretty simple. Just use a, a you know, high speed performance network and a server. However, in today's world, if you want to be competitive and also attract the best talent, your team could be spread across multiple geographical areas. Uh, Autodesk offers a solution that enables us currently to collaborate on Revit projects from anywhere as long as we have an internet connection. But how about sharing laser scan data? Um, like Doug said, uh, shipping hard drives can be a solution, but it's not the most effective solution. Also, we might be able to use some other cloud services where we upload data there, it's just a file structure. But using a non-proprietary platform like Scene2 to, to share large data sets, it allows your production team to work from anywhere, uh, basically. So in my opinion, tools like Scene2 are the future for laser scan data sharing. So now if um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit uh, and I'll touch on the uh, visualization aspect of the, the model 
uh, in this section. So I'll be talking um, about the uh, converting the uh, point cloud into a model, into something that's easy to be used by contractors, architects, developers. So we're taking that data and converting it into a set of information. Um, so after receiving countless feedback from our clients, I came to realize that there are four characteristics that make a three-dimensional ASBL model uh, remarkable. And uh, I'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about each one of those four characteristics um, in the order of their importance. So first uh, is the usability. Um, you know, much too often we want to start working on a project and generalize the client's needs based on past projects. Um, I think that one of the best approaches to understand how your product will serve others is not only to have a conversation with your client, but also to have conversations with all the project stakeholders and understand the goals of each one of them. If possible, you know, try to design your project approach to be flexible. What do I mean by, by that? Every company is operating based on internal standards and guidelines, and there are no two companies alike. However, to develop a high value deliverable, we recommend incorporating each client's standards and templates as part of your own workflows. Hence, at handoff, the client will not be able to tell the difference between your product and a model developed in-house. The goal is always to exceed the quality standards of the client. And in other industries, this approach is called maximization of the transactional value. Um, so let's jump to the second characteristic, which is the level of detail. Um, so Rob, can you switch to the next uh, slide? Thank you. So our role is always to listen to our clients and understand how the information we deliver, deliver will be utilized downstream. So by doing so, we will be able to find the sweet spot when it comes to how close the model will res re resemble the built environment. Also, good historic documentation will help tremendously to understand how a building uh, was constructed and, constructed and uh, to achieve a higher level of detail. The default level of detail when documenting uh, the existing condition should be LOD 200 like, like you just saw. But to exceed that level of detail, a uh, production team needs to have different types of data available. Uh, and those are and probably the most important uh, set of information is the record drawings. Uh, the drawings will offer the best understanding of the design intent as well as what is hiding behind finished surfaces. The second is a high detail point cloud um, the, the third is good photo, photo documentation. People might consider that, you know, maybe photos are not useful anymore, but uh, the scanner will capture most of the visible surfaces. However, if you want to study certain details, uh, photo, photographs are still the best way of documenting those conditions. And finally, uh, the field notes and sketches. I know that probably people, they, they don't use those anymore, but while we scan a building, we do like to uh, uh, take notes of any field observation that will help us to develop a model. Um, and that, that way is gonna be much closer to reality. The third characteristic is the level of accuracy. And the level of accuracy defined by the client will shape the documentation process as well as how your final product will look like. For instance, if the project requires a high level of accuracy, let's say up to a quarter of an inch, then the model will show a lot of the world's imperfections. Elements will not be modeled straight. Walls will not be modeled orthogonal. This type of product will, be, will have a completely different use than a model with a lower level of accuracy requirement. So for a level of accuracy, from a level of accuracy standpoint, there are two different complementary methods, which if implemented correctly, can result in excellent uh, products. The first is quality assurance. And what I'll describe next is not new, neither revolutionary, but it seems that quality assurance is very often overlooked by project managers. And in my opinion, in my opinion this is a process-oriented system that enables prevention of errors. And it is the responsibility of an entire project team. Um, so my recommendation is to set guidelines and rules on how to model and treat 
every condition, but also it is important to set guidelines on how to document instances that do not meet the level of accuracy specifications. And the second method is quality control. On our projects, quality control is performed by one person um, a few times during the, during the execution of the project or even uh, or when the project is close to being done. The goal is to detect errors and correct them before the product is handed off to the client. One thing that I would like to point out is that quality control is a reactive strategy. Um, so if your team does not have a solid quality assurance program in place, the quality control is not effective. By the time the project is ready for quality control, a production team places tens of thousands of elements in a model. So speed and uh, effectiveness are critical when checking the level of accuracy. Um, and one can perform these ta tasks two way. Uh, like you just saw using the traditional approach, uh, check every single model elements in Revit. Uh, you would have to take advantage of all the view types available, uh, floor plan, ceiling plan, sections, elevation views. It is tedious, but it does render good results. And, uh, but the approach that I like, which you see right now on, um, on the screen is using the scene to approach. Instead of checking elements for alignment accuracy, you're basically uh, checking spaces. Uh, hence the process is much more visual and it's much faster. And, and this process can be used by anybody on the project, not, not just the project manager, it can be used by the client, can be used by, um, let's say, higher level people in, in your company. Uh, so it definitely does not require um, a lot of technical skills like you, you need to have by using Revit. So it's definitely one of the um, uh, preferred methods of checking how well the model aligns with the point cloud. And probably the only downside at this point, hopefully this, uh, this feature is gonna be available in, in the future is the lack of direct connectivity with the Revit model. And so you cannot flag elements in scene to and push that information back into Revit for corrective action. And finally, the, uh, the last uh, characteristic is the visual appearance. And uh, this is uh, the least important uh, characteristic but is valuable nonetheless. Uh, in my opinion, adding material appearance to a model, it adds depth and it brings the project to life. The project that you just see, you're seeing right now on the screen is a historic building from Nashville, Tennessee, and is about a hundred years old. Um, and yeah, you know, probably if you're from Europe, you might say that that's not, that's not old enough, but it's, you know, it's an old building for us here in the US. This model, in our opinion, meets all those four, four characteristics and the project stakeholders, they had four goals. The model to be developed, developed using uh, the client's standards and templates. Uh, it had to be developed at a level of detail 300 to allow for demolishing of finishes and other building components without affecting the load bearing elements. Uh, we needed to ensure a level of accuracy 30 uh, while maintaining full usability for documentation. So that's, you know, nothing was allowed to be outside of a 5 8 of an inch uh, tolerance. And um, math materials for owners, uh, walkthroughs and renderings. So there you have it. Uh, these are the most, uh, the most important characteristics for developing a um, as asthma model based on our clients feedback. All right. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Dominic speaking again. That was a great uh, presentation. Thank you, Silvio. Uh, maybe a quick uh, closing comment uh, from you, Doug, before we move to the Q&A session. Okay, um, just very quickly. I, I really hope that today's presentation demonstrated the importance of cultural heritage documentation and also um, the significant benefit of online project management using a system uh, such as Sintu. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. For uh, thank you. I would like to thank all the panelists for their contribution today. 
Uh, we have some time for uh, for questions, uh, Rob. Yep. Uh, so yeah, just give me a second here to get caught up with these real quick. Um, so one of the questions came around. Uh, actually, several of them on the VR side of things. Uh, so one of the questions was: Is do we support the Oculus Quest? Uh, at this time, we do not. We are looking at that. Uh, like Dominic mentioned earlier, we currently support the HTC Vive. Pro as well as the Oculus Rift and Oculus Rift S. Um, another question came in on any thoughts of viewing intensity uh, or normals. Dominique, you want to answer that one? Uh, yeah, we, we do support, uh, we do display the intensity uh, of the scanner today. So basically when you go into the scan mode, so you see the scan data from uh, the vantage point, you can be either in the 2D panoramic mode, so you see the 2D picture, or you can be in any of the following 3D modes. The first one being 3D RGB, second one will be 3D surface, uh, next one will be 3D X-ray, uh, last one will, uh, next one will be uh, 3D uh, intensity, and the last one will be 3D height map. We can uh, colorize the mesh uh, based on the z-axis to, to have a sense of, for example, uh, of the floor flatness. So the, I know the intensity is already covered, but I know that we can do better. Uh, people would like to colorize the intensity as a, a little bit like Autodesk Recap uh, is doing. And uh, this is coming. So uh, today our intensity mode uh, is, is there, but not to the level uh, that it could be uh, and we are working on that. Okay. Uh, most of these are all kind of Sintu based. Uh, one of them is, is, does Sintu support unstructured data from mobile mapping systems yet? Uh, this is another great question. Uh, not today. So today you have to uh, upload or import and upload um, uh, structured data. That means uh, uh, data that is, uh, can be a, a structure uh, E57 or structure RCP from Autodesk or a structure FLS or LS Proj from Faro. Um, that means uh, we need to know the vantage points. Uh, we need to have the, 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 the panoramic images on the depth maps on the point cloud. Uh, what we're working on now is uh, the import of unstructured data. So like the data you get uh, after scanning a site with uh, like uh, the Leica blk to go or uh, Navis uh, M6 or Navis uh, VLX. Uh, so we're working hard on that. Uh, the first results look really great and amazing. So you can expect that to be uh, in the platform before the end of this year. Okay, hopefully uh, early Q4. Uh, for, so the next few months is needed to, to implement that. But uh, the technology is there to support indoor mobile LiDAR. Great. Got another one for you, Dominique. Uh, so can you download meshes from Sentu and what platforms can these meshes be imported to? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so what, as, as you understand, Sentu Cloud is based on the fact that we will transform each scan, uh, each, the, the, the point cloud coming from each scan position into a very high resolution mesh. And this, uh, this point cloud to mesh transformation is done before the upload, okay? So on the computer where you have your uh, source point cloud, this is where you run this point cloud to mesh. So everything uploaded to the cloud is mesh based. We'll make the data about 10 to 20 times smaller in size. So everything uploaded will be mesh based, 10 to 20 times smaller. And of course, uh, we embed those uh, streaming technology that will make the high res uh, mesh being easily uh, streamed from the cloud. Now you can do the inverse transformation back, okay? So because some point like uh, in Revit, for example, you need still, uh, you still need a RCP file or RCS file. So we can uh, download the data and do the inverse transformation mesh to point cloud, okay? And get the RCP, RCS, or RE57 in your desktop app for scan to BIM. The other, uh, so the question is more related, can we download the mesh? Yes, you can do that. So in, you know, if prior to downloading the mesh, we, we, you will run a, a, a unification process, which means that we will take, let's say you want to, uh, to get a mesh of one of the rooms or one, uh, one equipment or a complete floor, uh, up to 100 scans can be included in this unification process. And so uh, what you do, you unify the mesh into cloud. So this is a cloud computer using cloud computing. And that will create a single mesh by taking the best contributions of 
uh, each mesh coming from each can. Okay, so that takes some time. If you uh, request a small mesh, like okay, coming from five to ten scans, that can be thirty minutes or or less. If you request uh, a big mesh from one hundred scans, that may take longer. At some point, this mesh becomes uh, downloadable. You can also select the mesh density, so the resolution of the mesh, and the format. It can be OBJ, FBX, or STL. Okay, and at some point when the computation is over, you receive a notification by email that you can download the resulting unified mesh from your Cloud platform. And then this mesh being an OBJ, FBX, or STL uh, can be used in any, uh, you know, uh, mesh-based uh, uh, desktop app. It can be uh, Unity, it can be uh, Unreal, it can be uh, 3ds Max, it can be uh, also uh, Navisworks supports uh, FBX. Uh, you can, we have a workflow that is uh, documented on the platform that uh, shows you how to get uh, a unified mesh first as FBX into Navisworks and then export from Navisworks as an OBJ for Revit. This is one workflow. So this is all covered. Absolutely. Great. Well, I think that sums up most of the questions we had. Uh, a lot of them kind of revolved around the same, the same type of question. So thank you. Uh, I would like to wrap up and give a special thank you to our, our participants. I mean, some great insight, some great, you know, industry knowledge. We really appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, other than that, uh, like I said, this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. We should have it up there uh, probably by tomorrow at the latest. So please check that out. Uh, once again, thank you everyone and stay safe and stay healthy. <laughs>